This is Wrestling with Wrestling Past and Present. I'm Tim Kurt. And I'm Roland Bulis. And today on episode 31, we are talking about Bash at the Beach 1996, perhaps one of the most important and influential pay-per-views in WCW history. That's not going to work for me, brother. <laughs> um, yeah, no, it it definitely, um, I think, put WCW on the map mm-hmm. um, at that time. Um, I know that WWF at the time was was the big company, and I think that you know WCW had some steam. They had Hogan, they had Savage, they've always had Flair. I mean, I know Flair kind of bounced back and forth for a cup of coffee, um, but like I, I think that this having the outsiders come in and doing it the way they did it definitely brought a lot of fans from WWF and some of the fans from maybe a fair weather aspect that wanted to see how the storyline was going to pay off. Oh, absolutely. I think it definitely kind of, you know, changed the audience a little bit. I mean, we're going to get into it. This is the show where the NWO is formed. Um, so we'll get into that. That's going to be in our main event, but the undercard though, a lot of decent matches on here and a lot of names that you're going to recognize. So we're going to run through all there's 14 matches in total. When you include the, uh, the pre-show main event, uh, so kind of a lot of matches here to go through. And we will start with Jim Powers defeating Hugh Morris in the dark match in about 4 minutes and 23 seconds. Uh, we all know Hugh Morris, Bill DeMont, um, had, you know, he was gen- general erection at one point. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. You, you, you huge erection huge or something erection, like that. Huge yeah. erection, yeah. yeah. Not, uh, that way, and you can tell... That was back when Russo was there. It yep. had to be. Because Russo had that sexual innuendo, like, comedic, dumb shtick that is, he's actually famous for that. Like, some of the some of the stuff he's done, if, if it sounds like that, chances are Russo had something to do with it. Yeah, I totally yeah. agree there. <laughs> and then your main event show, which is essentially their pre-show, this match a little surprising that it's not on the main card. You have the Steiner brothers getting a win over Harlem Heat uh, by disqualification. This was for the World Tag Team Championship. It went about five minutes long. So a lot of names. Everybody knows the Steiner brothers. Everybody knows Harlem Heat. So it's a little little interesting that this show was on the pre-show and not the actual pay-per-view. Yeah, I, uh, weird placement. I don't know if they were trying to get people to, you know, you would have thought that show, that, that match would have closed the show, you would have thought, if, mm-hmm. if they were trying to get interest in the pay-per-view because if you end the you end the main event show with that you know maybe somebody would be like oh wow that was great what are they gonna you know maybe they get them to buy the pay-per-view but yeah i I don't i don't know what their thoughts was but um it definitely is a weird thing to put on a main event especially for the championship i mean i know it wasn't a clean finish maybe maybe that was part of it too knowing that they maybe they were continuing the storyline by not having a clean finish but um like you said harlem Heat and the slider brothers two Hall of Fame uh, tag teams in my book. I know the Steiners aren't there yet, but I, I would imagine they would end up there. I mean, I know Scott Steiner has a little bit of heat with the WWF, but WWE. You got to hear that Well, I mean, I, I would imagine that, you know, I mean, if, if you can have Warrior and you can have uh, Bruno and all these guys make up with Vince, I would imagine at some point Scott Steiner can kiss and make up with Vince too. Mm-hmm. But yeah, in my my opinion, two Hall of Fame tag teams. Um, Steiner, some of the stuff that Scott Steiner did before he got all jacked up, the the Frankenstein's and stuff that he would do were way ahead of his time. Um, so, and especially for a guy, I mean, he wasn't a little guy either. No, uh, by, any, by any means, he was just super athletic. But um, yeah, no, it's it's weird to see that on the pre-show. I agree. Next up, you have Bobby Walker getting a win over Billy Kidman in two minutes here. So obviously not much of a match on the main event. Uh, Billy Kidman, though, one of, the, one of the more underrated workers in professional wrestling. Um, I believe he's still working backstage with WWE. I'm not sure if he got was part of those layoffs a couple I months ago. I think he might have been. Yeah. I think he might have been. I can't remember now, but I, I, yeah, I think... Uh... I think he might have been. I mean, most notably, he married Tori, Tori Wilson. So, yes. you know, it's a good, good for him on that one. I mean, not, they're not together now, but, I mean, definitely an overachiever on that, by that aspect. So. That's true. <laughs> <laughs> Next up is the tag team match here. You have the Rock and Roll Express, Ricky Morton and Robert Gibson. 
getting a win over Fire and Ice, which was Scott Norton and Ice Train in about 2 minutes and 8 seconds. Uh, Rock and Roll Express, obviously one of the more legendary tag teams, NWA days. Um, so they've got their name recognition here. Scott Norton um, would later become part of the NWO. Uh, so, yeah, so, you know, some names here in this match. Yeah, I mean, the like you said, uh, NWA, WCW, uh, Smoky Mountain Wrestling, a- any of those territories back in the 80s and, and early 90s, the Rock and Roll Express, that's where they were. You know, I mean, yeah. they were... They were the the tag team. I think them them in the midnights, uh, you know, had some great matches, good rivalry, um, and I mean they still they they still wrestle now. Yes, they do. <laughs> and they're they're in their fifties, or sixties probably by I, now. I would think. I believe, and I might be wrong, but I believe they recently made an appearance on AEW uh, not too long ago. Yeah, I mean, uh, looking at it, Ricky Morton's sixty three, mm-hmm. and Robert Gibson is sixty one. So they're both in their sixties early 60s and they're still actually wrestling i know they had a little bit um they had a little thing on the um, nwa power uh show there for a little while they had a a program with uh with uh the former brutus magnus nick aldis um the world champion there um Mm -hmm. recently i mean i think like last fall so i mean they're still relevant today which is what i'm trying to get at um so it's it's incredible to I think they're probably because they never really went to the WWE I think that they're under a little under the mainstream media of who they are but I mean they're a legend in territory days and to an extent NWA. In your final match on main event and this match I think it also can be uh, a pay per view worthy Eddie Guerrero getting a win over Lord Steven Regal in three minutes and thirty eight seconds. I know on the main event show they don't have a whole lot of time, but it's kind of a shame that these guys didn't get uh, more time. These are both two fantastic workers. Uh, this would have been a match I would have loved to go back and watch. Yeah, I mean, no no offense to some of the matches that were on the main card, and we'll, we'll get into that, but there's definitely a couple of matches in the main card that could have been off the main card, mm-hmm. and they could have easily put this one and the Steiner match with, with Harlem Heat on the main card, and it would have made the card so much better. And they would have got a little more time, too, which would have made the match even better. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, you can't say enough about Eddie Guerrero or Steven Regal, William Regal. Uh, I mean, they're just fantastic performers. And I think that, you know, if Eddie were still with us today, that I think he'd still have something to do with wrestling somewhere, whether it be with NXT or even with AEW. Vicky's in AEW now. I mean, you don't know what Vicky would have done had Eddie still been alive. Yeah. You know, so um, it, it's weird to look back and think, but I obviously someone who was lost way too soon, um, Eddie... Eddie Guerrero arguably um, was, uh, again, we talk about Kidman being an overachiever. I think Eddie Guerrero was to an extent because I think Vince McMahon, um, you know, it, JR in his book even says that, you know, Vince, you know, is like, oh, he's tiny, he's small, you, you know. So for him to win the title and, and do all that with WWE before he passed away, um, definitely overachieved, I think. Um, maybe not in his book or his fans, you know, thinking of him, but I definitely – think that uh, ultimate overachiever for what Vince had for him in, in the WWE. So let's get to the actual show here, Bass of the Beast, 1996. We get things started with Ray Mysterio Jr. getting a win over Psychosis in just over 15 minutes. This is early Ray Mysterio. I think it's his second or second match in the company. Uh, he made his debut the month prior against Steve Malenko. This is the second match against Psychosis. Um, I thought this was a really good in a smart way to open up the show, you have people, uh, two wrestlers that can do fantastic moves that a lot of the bigger guys cannot do. So that was a smart way to open the show. That was a, a, a really good match. Um, and again, we kind of see the beginnings of what we would know Ray Mysterio to become. Yeah, he, um, you know, a very young, very, very small. I mean, not that Ray Mysterio is huge now, but I mean, he, you look at him in, in 96, he was friggin' tiny. I mean, he, I mean, he's, he's bulked up, you know, cause he's gotten older, but I mean, obviously he hasn't grown any height wise, but you, you, you look at, you look at him, you know, now and you're like, wow, he, back then he was, um, you know, a very, very small guy I and mean, he's always been a small guy, but, um, it was probably the perfect way to start, like you said, start the pay-per-view hot, you know, get two guys out there and actually have a, a legitimate wrestling match. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, absolutely. Now, next up, uh, not the greatest wrestling match of all time. 
Uh, <laughs> not, not to cut you off, but this is one of those matches you could have just like swapped out with Eddie Guerrero and Steven Regal or yes. you know, whatever. Like, yeah. you know, this match didn't need to be there. But no. anyhow. <laughs> it's uh, John Tenta. You may know him know him as Earthquake from his WWF days. Getting or a, Shark. Or the Shark. Getting a win over Big Bubba, who was also the Big Boss Man. Or Ray Trailer. Or Ray Trailer. Big Bubba Rogers. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Big Bubba is accompanied by Jimmy Hart here. And this is a Carson City silver dollar match which is basically there's a sock full of silver dollars hanging up on a pole and <laughs> one of these big guys had to climb the pole to get the silver dollars and were able to use them in the match and of course so none of them could do that so they had jimmy hart go and do it <laughs> yeah i mean and the pole was like 12 feet in the air like, it wasn't like it wasn't like a six foot pole it was no. like way up there i know and i'm thinking to myself too like when the match started i'm like how is uh, either one of these, you know, they're, they're big guys. Uh, how are they going to get up this pole? Yeah. And um, it was, uh, you know, maybe this was the beginning of the, the Judy Bagwell on a pole match or the, <laughs> the Viagra on a pole match. Yeah. Or the, you know, I mean, WCW had some real crappy pole match gimmick matches that, um, I mean, th- this match itself was ugly. It, um, yeah, it was. Yeah, there was. There was honestly no good wrestling in this match. Um, for whatever reason, uh, Bubba, Big, Big Bubba Rogers had uh, <laughs> shaved part of John Tenta's head mm-hmm. previously, and John Tenta didn't think it was a good idea to shave the rest of it. <laughs> so he just like left half his head with hair on it. I, I don't know. I mean, again, storyline and fake wrestling, I, you know, whatever. But like, <laughs> he comes up, and I'm like, look at this clown. You know, like he's got, like, he's got like, you know, it'd be like me trying to grow my hair out. Anybody that knows me knows that that ain't gonna happen because I don't <laughs> have hair on the top of my head. But that, that's what it looks like. It just, it was bad. It, I don't know. Like I said, obviously it was storyline related, but he just, it, yeah, there was yeah. nothing in this match that was enjoyable except for watching Jimmy Hart scurry up the, the pole. scurry up the pole and then come down in his face when he turned. He he turned and gave the sock to who he thought was Big Bubba. And, and as soon as he realized it was Tenta, he about crapped himself. And his, his facial expression pretty much made the match yes. at that point. <laughs> and, uh, yeah, that's that's all I really took away from that match. It was, um, yeah, it was there, and it shouldn't have been, <laughs> in my opinion. <laughs> and the gimmick matches keep coming. You have Diamond Dallas Page getting a win over Jim Duggan in a taped fist match in about five and a half minutes. I thought this was kind of weird because it was a tape fist match, but then Diamond Dallas Page kind of cut off the tape of Jim Duggan, so Jim Duggan wrestled with no tape on his fist. Uh, so. Yeah, no, it was definitely weird. I don't, yeah, I don't know. It was a weird match. I, I thought this one was kind of sloppy as well, like the Tenta Big Bubba match. Nothing really there for me. It's kind of, uh, it's kind of a filler. Um, again, this is early DDP here. He's just kind of just starting out. Um, and then obviously as a wrestler, I mean, as a wrestler. Been, he had been a, you know, a manager or a mouthpiece for a while, yeah. but yeah, as an actual wrestler by himself. Yeah. This is, he's very green. Um, he still has that pompous attitude at the time. He's not a good guy. He's, he's a bad guy at the time. Mm-hmm. And, um, it, it wasn't bad, but this is definitely, um, gimmick match central here for WCW between this match, the last match and even the next match. And the next match too. <laughs> And speaking of that match, we have a, and I'm not making this up, a double dog collar match between the Nasty Boys and Public Enemy. So basically, a member of the Nasty Boys is tied uh, uh, is tied to a member of Public Enemy with a dog collar or hanging around their neck. And this is not a wrestling match. This is a brawl. They're fighting in the back in the uh, entrance area, which is kind of set up like a beach. There's like a lifeguard station. There's a uh, at one point, there was a surfboard involved. I think there was a shark involved. <laughs> uh, yeah, it, it was. Um, I mean, it wasn't a terrible match because they made it. They actually made the gimmick kind of uh, more gimmicky by mm-hmm. by doing more things outside the ring. So I mean, it wasn't. It was more enjoyable in the first two gimmick matches, I think. Put it that way. Um, and it, it, there, was, there was a spot in the match where uh, poor. I don't know. I think it was Rock O Rock, but he. Um, Bounces off the friggin' table twice. Yeah, I know that that table would not break. <laughs> and even even uh, either Heenan or Shivani is like, this has to be the world's strongest table. Yeah, like, yeah, and it's not like you know. So at the beginning of the match, like you said, you had Brian Knobs with Rocco Rock and 
Johnny Grunge with Jerry Sags is how they had that paired off. Mm -hmm. Um, and yeah, it was, it it was weird that, um, they decided to do three gimmick matches right in a row. Um, but like I said, this one was definitely the most enjoyable and it it made me laugh out loud watching him. I mean, it had to friggin' hurt, especially the second time he got slammed off that table and you could just see like his whole back just like, it, it looked so bad. I'm like, Oh man. And uh, even, like I said, one of the announcers, I don't know if it was Shivani or Heenan, was like, oh, this has to be the strongest table ever. <laughs> and it's true, because it's not like the guys, it's not like Rey Mysterio's bouncing off no. the table. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, that, it didn't even crack. He just, boom, bounced off it, boom, bounced off it again. <laughs> so yeah, it was, um, like I said, it was entertaining. It wasn't a great wrestling match, but it wasn't supposed to be. No. no. But it was definitely the most entertaining out of the three gimmick matches, in my opinion. No, I agree. I actually, I enjoyed this one. I was kind of laughing a little bit throughout the match, and I was highly entertained by this. I mean, like you said, it's not a great wrestling match, but it, that wasn't what it was intended to be. Um, it was intended to be entertaining, and I think they kind of pulled it off what they you know, set out to do. All right, moving on. Our next match is a singles match for the WCW Cruiserweight Championship. You have Dean Malenko, who is the Cruiserweight Champion, getting a win over Disco Inferno by submission in about a little over 12 minutes. Uh, Disco Inferno coming out, doing his whole disco gimmick, dancing, you know, to the ring and everything. Um, they've kind of played it up in the past where, like, you know, he would get distracted and not go for covers. And he kind of did that in this match where he would take his time going for covers, which might have cost him. Um... So, but I thought this match was actually pretty good. I thought, you know, Dean Malenko is an excellent worker, and I thought Disco Inferno held his own. Um, it provided some relief after the three gimmick matches that we had to actually have a wrestling match here. Um, so I thought this match was pretty good. Yeah, um, Dean Malenko, uh, for what he lacks in personality, makes up for in wrestling ability. He is probably the, well, I'm not going to say the best, but one of the best. I can probably count on one hand some of the people that have the wrestling ability that he has. Mm-hmm. Um, and it was funny because, the, like you said, the match started off as Malenko pretty much burying Disco for like the first five, six, eight minutes of the match. Disco yeah. wasn't doing anything, but he kept kicking out. And then, you know, like you said, then he fight Disco actually started, you know, mounting a comeback. And, uh, yeah, you can see there were spots where he tried to dance, and then he was like, oh, no, no, I can't. I have to, you know, and he tried, he tried to be serious but he still played up the, the dancing gimmick. I think this was a very good wrestling match. Uh, Psychology-wise, re- you know, execution. You know, Glenn Gilberti, for, for all the flack he gets for being the Disco Inferno and having that gimmick and whatever, he is um, a very good wrestler. Uh, you know, to quote, you know, JR or Bruce, he's a good hand. He really is. And um, it, it was a great match uh, to come out of the gimmick match. I think it was a good match. The pace was good. Um it was a very intense match, too, at times. Some of the stuff that Malenko laid in was pretty stiff. Uh, yeah. Disco also laid in some stiff some stiff stuff. So it, it made for a really good recovery from the three gimmick matches, I think. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, yeah. Next up, though, you have Steve McMichael with Queen Debra getting a win over Joe Gomez in about 6 minutes and 44 seconds. Steve McMichael, part of the Four Horsemen here. He was obviously a member of the Chicago Bears uh, 1985 championship team. Um, Queen Deborah with Deborah McMichael, who later became the wife of Stone Cold Steve Austin. Um, so, you know, obviously they're, they're building Steve McMichael up here. This is only, his, I think they said it's his third match in the company. Um, he's not an experienced wrestler coming over from the football world. I actually thought he did pretty well. I mean, he's not an experienced wrestler, like I just said. Um, he's an athlete, and... So I thought he held his own here. I mean, it wasn't the greatest match. It was kind of more so for filler, I think. Um, but it wasn't. It wasn't as bad as it it could. It looks on paper. Put it that way. Yeah, I. It, it's funny to to think about you know this being only his third match. It wasn't as bad as it could have been for a third match. But if you think back, if you if you watch the pay per view. Uh, for you know the the people that listen to this podcast, if you actually watch the pay per view, watch how he runs the ropes. Mm-hmm. He does not run the ropes, you know, flat backed against the ropes. He like turns, yeah, and he almost stops. And so you could definitely tell he's not real sure of what he was doing exactly, but he still executed it halfway decent. I guess is the best way to best way to put it. Um, and I honestly don't know who Joe Gomez is, nor do I want to know who <laughs> Joe Gomez is. But he 
he definitely was put in there probably because just like you know a disco inferno he's probably a pretty good hand yeah he was able yeah. to you know work a good match and he did the match if, if you would put that in there with like ddp or or even hacksaw jim dunn the match would have been friggin' horrible mm-hmm. it would have been a horrible match but thankfully they were smart enough to put him in there with somebody that could kind of go and uh you know it, it definitely wasn't great but i mean it wasn't bad either for, for a third match it wasn't terrible and kudos for them for letting Steven Michael do a tombstone pile driver. I mean, that's a, a dangerous move, and he, has, he doesn't have that much experience. <laughs> yeah, obviously, I would hope that him and Joe Gomez practice that at some point yeah. during the day. I would hope because if I were Joe Gomez, I wouldn't want to do it nope. unless I knew he could do it. Yeah, because um, like you said, third match out, he's doing the Undertaker finisher <laughs> on you know, and we've seen you know neck injuries. I mean, we've seen what happens if you sit down on that for Stone Cold when Owen Hart did it. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, you can, you can, I mean, you have somebody like Hulk Hogan who, um, I, I don't know if people know this, but supposedly the undertaker, when he tubestone Hulk Hogan the first time back in 1992, 1990, some, somewhere in there, Hogan supposedly got hurt on the, on the tubestone and, and, um, kind of made the undertaker, they, they made at that time, the undertaker was fresh in the business and it kind of, it well, in WWF and it kind of made him look like an unsafe worker but if you go back and watch it hogan's full of shit he, yeah the undertaker would not have coddled him anymore his head's three inches from the mat he drops him you know clean but i mean what what could you know what could have happened you know if if uh mongo had done that wrong you know he could he joe gomez could have died i mean look at the draws you know it, a, a guy that you know it, all it was you know look at tyson kidd mm-hmm. the guys that have done less have been hurt worse I guess is what I'm trying to say. So kudos to you know Joe Gomez for allowing a guy with a third match in the company to do a two stone pile driver. I guess yeah. that's a long way. That's a long way of saying that it was uh, like you said, um, pretty impressive. And next up is a singles match for the United States Championship. You have Ric Flair along with Miss Elizabeth and Woman, who is Nancy Sullivan. Getting a win. Who would go on to be Nancy Benoit. Yes. <laughs> in case you don't know who that was. And Ric Flair will get a win over Conan here, and he will become the uh, U.S. champion. Uh, a lot of interference by Woman and Miss Elizabeth here. There's a shoe spot where they get knocked, where Conan gets knocked out by a shoe. Um, there's a low blow in here, which when that happens, Dusty Rhodes' reaction on commentary was so funny. <laughs> he, she hit him low. <laughs> yeah. Well, and then, and then at one point, too, during the pay per view, he also said, you know, and Dusty Rhodes is is very southern. You know, the southern draw that he has, if you will. You know, he he says groin. You know, he hit him in the groin, and it just the way that it, it, you, you had to literally say, "What the hell did he just say?" Yeah. <laughs> you had to think about what he said because it was like groin. Hit him in the groin. It's like what? What did he do? But yeah, no, it's uh. Dusty Rhodes, I think, it was too bad he wasn't on commentary more. I know. But yeah, no, I, I think this match, um, on paper, uh, at first I was like, wow, well, uh, this is going to be a Styles Clash type of match. Um, you know, Flair, Flair has no high-flying ability whatsoever. The only high-flying ability he has is to get thrown off that side of the top rope when he gets crotch up there trying to do it. I mean, he does that every match almost. Yeah. Um, but... It really wasn't that bad. It was sloppy with, with like you said, with the finish and the interference was kind of a little iffy at times. But the match itself was actually pretty good. And at one point, Conan put him in the figure four. Yes. Um, and it, it, the mad, the wrestling itself was actually pretty good. And Conan is also kind of fresh to the WCW scene. Um, he'd been there a little bit longer than some of the like Psychosis and, and, and Ray and those guys. But he's definitely a newer, a newer character to stateside. Him. Psychosis and Ray, they just wrestled the night before in Mexico. And they they played that up in the pay per view numerous times. They, you know, hey, they just made it back, you know, they so they were pretty much setting Conan up to lose by, by talking about that, but also using that as that's why he lost. Mm-hmm. You know, mm-hmm. you can I, I don't know if they furthered that out or not, but at least they gave him a little bit of a a reprieve almost by by stating the facts that hey, they just traveled to Mexico and back to get here. So, uh, but yeah, no, it was definitely sloppy, like you said, with the interference. Um, and yeah, it, it's too bad they didn't have a, you know, at one point, Miss Elizabeth is clocked. Yeah. Conan, Conan comes off the apron, and I mean, he, she just bounces right back up like she didn't get hit. I mean, she, she got hit pretty hard. 
Yeah, absolutely. But yeah, I thought it was a decent match for what it was. But like you said, it's a little bit sloppy in spots. Uh, you know, obviously not going to be a, uh, not a clean finish at all. Um, but I thought it was all right. I thought it was you know decent, especially coming off the C McMichael match. <laughs> Well, and like I said, though, on paper, you're like, ooh, Conan and Flair. Like, oh, I don't know. And, and I think it over-delivered, in my opinion, because when I saw it, I'm like, ugh. I'm like, that's going to be, you know, bowling shoe ugly, to quote JR again. Um, but it really wasn't bad. The match itself really wasn't bad. They actually had pretty good chemistry, surprisingly. In our next match, we have tag team action here with the Giant and the Taskmaster, who's Kevin Sullivan, uh, getting a win over on it, on it. Hmm. Easy for me to say. <laughs> easy, easy for you to say. Yeah, wow. Arn Anderson. There we go. <laughs> and Chris Benoit. <laughs> it's, it's funny that you struggled on the Arn Anderson part and not any of those other. You said Taskmaster. You said Chris Benoit. And Arn Anderson was a struggling that, player. That's the real one, yeah. <laughs> Old double A. Double A. There we go. I can say that pretty <laughs> easily. The enforcer. Uh, yes. Anyways. <laughs> so th this match. Uh, I don't know. I wasn't really thrilled with this one. It kind of was just there for me. I know they had a decent story leading up to it. Um, I think the if if Double A and Chris Benoit won, one of the four horsemen was going to get a championship match against the Giant. Um, so they had a little bit of storyline and stakes, as Eric Bischoff likes to call it, in this match. But I just thought the execution of this wasn't very good. I, I wasn't really entertained. It was kind of just there for me. Yeah, um... It could have been so much better. It wasn't, again, it was kind of like the, the Mongo McMichael and Joe Gomez match. It was just, it, it wasn't terrible, but it wasn't great either. Mm -hmm. uh, it was just too bad because, you know, Arn Anderson and, and Benoit and even Kevin Sullivan, um, you know, at this point have been in the business long enough. They, they you know, are, are great technicians and, and good wrestlers. I mean, okay, maybe Kevin Sullivan's not great, but he's still, you know, serviceable. And, uh, you know, the Giants very green still, even though he's the world champion. Um, and you know they played the the uh, we'll make the giant run away so he can gang up on on Kevin Sullivan at the beginning. They had Mongo come out, hit him with a briefcase, and he chased him. Jimmy Hart had to go wrangle him and stuff and get him back. But um, yeah, it it definitely underdelivered a little bit. But I think I, I don't know I don't know how you have the world champion in a tag match and expect him to lose that match unless there is some weird stuff that happens. Mm -hmm. and I think really the best part of this and the most intriguing part of this was after the match when Benoit was beating the crap out of Sullivan. Yeah. yeah. And that, that led to a woman, Nancy Benoit, Nancy Sullivan at the time coming out and pleading with Chris Benoit of all people to stop hitting Kevin Sullivan. So it was, um, it was definitely interesting, but yeah, I, it definitely, um, for the placement on the card, it underdelivered for what it should have been. All right, let's All talk right. about our main event here. It's supposed to be a six-man tag team match with the Outsiders and the third man. They've been playing this up throughout the whole night. Who's the third man that's joining the Outsiders? Uh, they're going to go against Randy Savage, Sting, and Lex Luger. Uh, I don't think anybody cares about the actual match. It's what happened at the end is what everybody talks about. Uh, we all know the third man would end... Well, I should say this. Hulk Hogan comes down to the ring. They're thinking that they're going to attack the out, uh, the Outsiders. But instead, he turns himself on Randy Savage, drops a couple leg drops, and he is revealed as the third man to join Kevin Nash and Scott Hall. The match ultimately ends in a no contest, but that's not the story. The story is Hulk Hogan's the third man, and we have the formation of the NWO. Well, and let's put it in perspective what happened first too before before we get to the finish you have the two outsiders you have sting luger macho at one point sting does a stinger splash on kevin dash but luger's in the corner too he gets quote unquote knocked out cold mm -hmm. right so the only reason i'm going into this is because when hogan comes out you know 10 minutes later wearing the red and yellow bobby heenan kind of gave this away a little by, bit. <laughs> by the way, by the way, he said how when Hogan was halfway to the ring. But whose side is he on? It's like no, you don't. At that point, you need to play up that he's there to replace Luger. That the, the whole time he's coming to the ring, like Dusty's doing his job, Tony's doing his job, and then Bobby Heenan. I love the guy; he's a great mind. Why do you even say at that point? Why do you put any doubt into uh, somebody watching what Hogan's there for? Why you don't do that? And that's the only thing that I took from that that was unfortunate is that, you know, halfway down the aisle, 
Heenan says, well, who is he? You know, what side is he on? It's like, no, stupid. You don't, you can't. You want everybody to believe he's there to replace Luger and help take, you know, this hostile takeover that they kept talking about, that he was there to say, this isn't going to happen. And that was like the biggest rewatching it. That was the biggest thing I took away from that. I mean, we already knew what happened. I mean, we've seen it. We, we know, we, we know, but it's too bad that the viewers at home kind of got spoiled a little bit, you know, by what was going to happen by Heenan even putting that in people's minds. He, he should not have even mentioned that or even thought that out loud because that then made people go, hmm, I wonder why he is there. It should have been he's there to kick the outsider's ass, plain and simple. Luger got knocked out. He's replacing Luger. And, and that's the thing, too, because Shivani during the match was saying, you know, we make the rules, hit him with a chair, you know, bring more guys, do, you know, and that would have been a believable part. But it's unfortunate that Heenan kind of jumped the gun a little bit. And, and kind of gave away or gave people doubt as to why Hogan was there. Yeah, I kind of took that too. When he didn't said that, you're like, oh man, you know, he's going to turn on them. Uh, yeah, he, he, he did kind of give it away. I kind of I agree with you what you said there. Well, and, and the younger me might not have caught up on that. The, mm -hmm. the younger me might have been like, oh yeah, Hogan's going to kick their ass. All right. Yeah, but I mean, like being, you know, being 34 and re watching it and knowing what I know about, you know, certain things, it's like, ugh. Dude, you couldn't have waited like a minute to say something. Like, just don't, don't even put that in people's minds. Yeah. yeah. Because you also, and, yeah, it's too bad they didn't play up that, you know, that Luger or Sting or Macho or one of those guys could have been. Because originally, if Hogan didn't do it, the plan was it was going to be Sting. Mm -hmm. So, like, you know, Luger, Luger gets knocked out by Sting. Was that an accident? You know, they, they could have played on that too a little bit. Of like, hey, you know, maybe, you know, maybe there's dissension, you know, or they could have played maybe Luger is going to come back as the third man. Who, who knows? But like knowing what we know now, there are so many opportunities for them to, you know, and like I said, it was still executed very well. Yeah. yeah. But it, there's it's like, man, you guys had some opportunity. Like I said, again, it, it's armchair quarterbacking, you know, literally, what, 24 years ago? Yeah, 24 yeah, years like, ago. Like, it, it's, it's, it's armchair quarterbacking, so I get it, but like... It's like, man, it's like you guys missed some opportunities there, and it's too bad because it could have been, especially during the you know, during the match, you could have been putting everybody at home. You could have had so much. You wouldn't even been thinking that Hogan would have been there for anything but to help, mm -hmm. and they done that right. Because the, the minute Sting knocks out Luger, you go, well, you you should be saying, well, maybe maybe Sting did that on purpose. Maybe Sting's in on it. Maybe Luger's in on it. Maybe he didn't really get knocked out. Maybe you know. There's so many options they could have done that it's too bad they didn't do. And like I said, again, it's nitpicking 24 years ago, and it was still pulled off great. But, um, you know, it was it was nice to see, um, you know, the response afterwards by the fans mm -hmm. was exactly what WCW wanted, probably more than they thought they were going to get. Yes, uh, the, all the trash that was getting thrown in the ring. Um, I actually heard, too, that something actually accidentally hit Mean Gene Okerlund and, it, like, broke his nose or something And uh, during that. Uh, because it, mean Gene's gone to interview Hogan after this all happened, and the fans are just bombarding the ring with trash. Um, so, and I think something actually hit Mean Gene. He kind of, like, shook his head at one point, so I think he got, something got him on the nose. Yeah, and it, you could see... Um... You know, it was funny to, you know, go back and listen. So Hogan says, you know, you can call this the New World Order. And then he keeps messing up at the end. Yeah, he keeps saying New World Organization. <laughs> yeah. And it's like, oh, Hulk, come on. Come on, Hulk. But yeah, he, um, it, it was definitely a moment that put, because it made, after this happened, it made um, WCW kind of be more reality based and Eric Bischoff has gone on record in saying that, that he knew that we had to make a change because we couldn't have these cartoony, you know, plumbers and clowns and stuff like WWF had at the time. Mm -hmm. They had to do something different and it made people tune in to see what was going to happen every week because it was so real, even though I mean, it wasn't, but I mean, they made it seem so they did such a good job of making it seem real that people every week had to tune in to see what was going to happen. Yeah, absolutely. De this this event definitely changed wrestling for the better, um, and changed wrestling history. I mean, the NWO that led to DX, that led to the Attitude Era in WWE, um, because WWE WWF at the time was getting their butt kicked by WCW for eighty three weeks. Uh, hence the name of Eric Bischoff's podcast. Um, yeah. 
and so that uh, this 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 right here led to so much uh, change in wrestling history. Uh, this is really a monument monumental pay per view, uh, not just in WCW but in wrestling as a whole. Well, and you think about it too. You know, you have you fast forward to WrestleMania 18. Mm-hmm. You know, H- Hogan Rock, as as Hogan and NWO comes back to WWF, would that have been that big of a deal if Hogan was a bad guy? Yeah. Going yeah. in? Probably not. Because they the fans, I mean, it still would have been Hogan Rock, but that that was electric too. So you don't know, you know, what that would have done for, for the business had that never happened. If Hogan had stayed babyface the whole time, who knows if it would have been... The, the reaction that they had at WrestleMania 18. So, I mean, there's so many, so many things that this influenced. And I, it, it may, I mean, there's some guys that joined the NWO. I mean, they watered it down a little bit, but if they had kept the NWO to like eight guys, mm-hmm. they, they could still be going now yeah. as, as a viable uh, faction. The problem was they had a lot of guys to put in the NWO. Like, the only person that didn't join the NWO was, like, Flair and DDP. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Everybody else joined the NWO at some point. So, it just, it's too bad that they went that, and a lot of that was the management of WCW and, and Bischoff being, you know, kind of thrown out of power and going home and then Russo being, so there was so much at, but this, this, this was for the next two years or so, this was what made WCW. Absolutely. Yeah. Definitely. So that is our rundown. Bash at the Beach, 1996, like we've been saying, one of the more important shows in wrestling history. Uh, so go out of your way, you know, watch it. Definitely watch the uh, the main event of that mat or main event of that show. Um, yeah, it's definitely historic. So I can't recommend it enough. I thought overall that was a pretty good show. I would probably give it, you know, there were some matches on the undercard that weren't really good. I would probably give it maybe a six, six and a half for the overall show. Yeah, I would say that if you're going to watch anything you know, for entertainment, you watch the Rey Mysterio match at the beginning. Mm-hmm. You could watch the dog collar match for pure entertainment. You could even watch the, the Dean Malenko match. That match was actually a really uh, good match. Yeah. Then, yeah, you could, then you could watch the final match. I mean, even the, even the Flair Conan wrestling wasn't bad. Nope. Um, so, yeah, I mean, there, it, the show itself, probably, yeah, I'd say six and a half, seven, you know, also. And. It, it could have been a little bit better, but it really wasn't that bad. Plus, knowing what it created at the end, where, you know, furthering WCW in, in the Monday Night Wars and making them, you know, the NWO, making them viable, um, you know, it's a historic event. So that's our rundown, Bash of the Beach, 1996. Coming up for you guys next week, we're going to do a, another Bash of the Beach show. This year, we're going to fast forward four years later to go to Bash of the Beach, 2000. A lot has changed in four years' time. We'll get into that uh, for you next week. Yeah, we're going to show you the... So the last WCW show we did was a pretty good show. This one was a, was a really good show as well. Um, well, you know, you go four years you know, from this show and, and, and only eight years from Beach Blast 92, and you have this. Yep. <laughs> <laughs> a lot of things have changed, and this was... The last Bash on the Beach uh, for WCW. It was. They ended like what nine months later, ten months later, something like that. Yeah, yeah. March so of two thousand one. You know, it was early two thousand when they ended. So, um, you know, this is at the heat of their cluster cluster F, <laughs> to say the least. Yeah. So, um, yeah, it's going to be interesting to go back and look at that and see how different it was just in four years' time. So that's coming up for you guys next week. In the meantime, today is 4th of July. Everybody have a great 4th of July. Thanks for listening to the podcast. We'll be back next week with Bash of the Beach 2000. Until then, I'm Tim Kirk. And I'm Roland Fulis. And this is Wrestling with Wrestling Past and Present. (laughs) 